Hello, I want to welcome everyone to our virtual panel event, The Impact of Microaggressions and Why They Matter. My name is Stacy Rowland. I am the Assistant Professor of Business Administration at Damon College, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you all for joining us for the 16th in our ongoing series of live virtual panel events to discuss meaningful topics like this. We welcome those who are joining us and thanks go out to our sponsor, the graduate program at Damon College for inspiring this event and allowing these conversations. So we do have a wonderful panel today. And right now I'd like to give the opportunity for each one of them to introduce themselves, identify their roles and titles so that those of you are watching We'll get to, to see a little bit or hear a little bit more information about them. So the first one we're going to start with is Erin Carmen. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the social work and sociology department at Damon. Um, this is in the uh, MSW program. And the bulk of my work is, is centered around um, addressing systems of oppression from a macro lens in the social work. Okay. Thank you, Erin. Next, we'll start with uh, Daniel Nielsen. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Diaz Nielsen. My pronouns are he, him, L, and uh, I serve as the director for the Office of Diversity Outreach and Development uh, at Kent State University. Um, and my daily work um, centers around diversity, equity, inclusion, and of course, belonging. And so I'm really excited to, to be here with y'all, and I hope you all learned something. Thank you, Daniel. Next, we have Sarah Frank. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Frank. My pronouns are she, her, Ea. I am the Director of Residence Life at SUNY Geneseo. I'm very excited to be here today. Most of my work focuses on residence life, but I'm also a member of the President's Commission on Diversity and Community, uh, Advancing Cultural Competency, and Bias Prevention and Response at our campus. Right down the road. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and then next we have Isaac Williams. Wait a minute, Isaac, I don't know if we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, but we couldn't hear you. Can you repeat that for us, please? Yes. Please start thank again. you. Hi, I'm Isaac Williams. I'm the Director of Marketing and Digital Strategy here at Damon College and um, here and happy to be part of the conversation. Awesome, and we were looking for one panelist, but I don't think she's joined us yet. Um, so when she does come in, she will introduce herself. But one of the things I wanna point out is, you know what, right now we have the privilege, I say the honor and the privilege to have such open communication or conversation on such an important topic. And it's just amazing that we have this opportunity and I'm so thankful for the panelists here who are willing to join us and share in their insight. Understand that all the views that are expressed here are those of the panelists and we welcome each other's insight. And of course we respect uh, their personal thoughts and those of you who are listening in or watching us on YouTube, we ask that you respect, um, respect their thoughts too. So thank you for having this conversation with us and we're gonna get started. So first, we're going to begin with Daniel. And Daniel, I'm just going to ask you to give a definition of microaggressions. Sure. Thank you. So, so microaggressions, um, uh, we've been hearing this, this term uh, lately, um, and, and some people are like, I think I know what it means. If, if I break it down, I, 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 it makes sense, perhaps. Um, and so really, the, the definition of, of microaggressions is that they're subtle messages sometimes and often they're subconscious uh, where um, you know behaviors or, or looks or gestures or tones where uh, it devalues, discourages, and, and, and really um, can create um, uh, uh, harm. And if you look at the idea of microaggressions, micro meaning small, and it doesn't mean they're small, they just means they might be brief. Um, and as far as the con context of the, the relationship or the, the the interaction between folks. Um, and then the aggression piece is, again, not, it doesn't, sometimes people feel like that means I'm being really forward or, or, or uh, uh, harmful, but it's really the harm. It's the harm that comes from 
uh, the interaction that you're having, right? Um, and so uh, we also wanted to kind of give uh, the history of the term microaggressions, right? Um, this term has really only been around since about around 1970, where we had a Harvard uh, a psychiatrist, Chester Pierce, he really coined this term and defined it as, quote, this subtle, stunning, often automatic and nonverbal exchanges, which are quote, put downs. Um, and this was from a 1978 article that he wrote. Um, a few years later, um, before that, though, in 1973, Mary, uh, uh, Dr. Mary Rowe uh, really started to include uh, and understand microaggressions could also happen toward women, and where Dr. Pierce was lo really looking at uh, Black or African-American um, um, people. Um, and then really recently, Dr. Wing Su, uh, I mean, around 2010, kind of understood that microaggressions happen to any um, marginalized group, um, which can include LGBTQ plus community, people with disabilities, of course, uh, racial and ethnic uh, individuals as well, but also religious minorities. Um, and one interesting point, and, and I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Stacey, is like in 2017, the, the term microaggressions actually just finally made it to the Webster's Dictionary. Now, most of us would have the dictionary uh, electronically, but for those who might get it in hand, um, it's only been there since 2017. So um, again, microaggressions are definitely things that we all have felt. Um, it's just now kind of understanding the, the context. And then actually, sorry, real quick, there's they come in three forms. There's this idea of micro assault, which are blatant, deliberate, uh, conscious, and really explicit um, forms of, of microaggressions. Some people might I suppose call this as like old fashioned racism, um, mm. where the, the, the feel, again, it just feels like, oh, I know that they're not uh, liking me because of a certain identity I may have. Um, then there's micro insults. Um, and then there's micro invalidations where really you're nullifying the thoughts and feelings of people um, uh, by either your language again or your behavior. So um, hopefully that helps kind of frame our conversation today to think about it uh, um, as far as what microaggressions are. Okay, thank you, Daniel. It, it, it's interesting. You said it, it you know, it, it was just really recognized in the dictionary of, in 2017. But, you know, when I just take a moment to think back, it's always been there. You know, it's something that's always existed. Um, and I go, is it just we've never put a term to it? And now it's coming to the forefront with all the changes that we're seeing in society. So, you know, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I want to just change and, and ask Sarah a quick question. Sarah, could you discuss how microaggressions truly impact the community and more importantly, impact the hearts of people? Thanks, Stacey. Sure. And, and thanks, Daniel. Um, you know, things only are identified, right, once they're identified. And I think, yeah, I really like what you said, Dan, uh, about um the the term only being added later and Stacey, how you expanded upon it, it just it's unnerving. Um, but things only happen if and change if if people make them, right? Um, so they have a tremendous impact on community. If we think about community as a united force, um, and we think about civic engagement and we think about people coming together, microaggressions cause tiny tears in what ought to be those bands, right, that bring us together. And like paper cuts, they're quick, they're shocking, they're unexpected and painful. Um, they're considered often, like Dan said, uh, too insignificant, right? Like not everyone notices them, they're subtle. Um, and I like to say they're too insignificant for stitches often. Um, we quickly shake them off and we use a little antiseptic, we move on at first, but after that thousandth one, right? It's like death by a thousand paper cuts and people wonder why folks from underrepresented backgrounds are screaming for change, you know, in our communities. Um, Cause after all, they're just paper cuts, right? Um, but a thousand paper cuts will cause a person to bleed to death and break the thickest binding of unity um, and tear a community to shreds. Um, and they happen to people that we care about most. So, for me, in my mind, they cause a stirring, right? They also are burning within people to ignite change. Again, it's in the in the dictionary now. It took a little bit of time, right? Um, but I've seen students on my campus in particular at SUNY Geneseo in so much pain. I've seen them at other institutions I worked at. I've seen my colleagues in pain. Um, I've seen their heartbreak um, and watched them completely withdraw and myself too. 
But on the other hand, I've seen tremendous surges of strength and connection develop that's led to actions and changes for improvements. Um, micro, people that experience microaggressions and, you know, because again, the individuals together make up a community, they feel like others, you know, they don't feel a part of the community. That's how it impacts it. They're afraid, angry, threatened, exhausted, confused. Um, they think they're wrong. They're ashamed of being a part of the group they're in. And then they're proud of that, right? Um, they feel less than, singled out, fetishized, like they're the problem, like they're the spokesperson. Um, and that really impacts the community, right? Um, they feel alone, invisible, hurt, shocked, like they don't belong. And that's sort of where we're at right now with that language around belonging. Um, personally, um, they've given me both a pause and a push. Um, they prevented me and empowered me. They put me in the spotlight and put me into darkness. Um, and the impact is measurable and immeasurable. Um, but I think it's something that we need to think about, you know, as our communities, um, as we want them to come together and continue, we need to really think about how it impacts their heart, how it impacts the core of what they're doing and, and the meaning behind um, microaggressions, whether it was intended or not, um, they matter and they can really break the binds. But hopefully from that, we can teach and learn and grow to rebuild. Thank you, Sarah. You know, it was really impactful, the illustration you gave with the paper cuts. Because when I think of a paper cut, it can be so subtle, sometimes you don't even recognize it, but it really can hurt. And think about the duration of time it hurts. It's not just that moment, but, you know, as it's trying to heal, you you bang it, you, you, you know, you stop it. Sometimes you cut it again, and it's almost something that just kind of reignites. So when you said that, I thought of, imagine a, a community of people who feel that way. Right. Day in and day out and the impact it has on society. So, I, you know, it, that's just, I just, that that illustration really just kind of brought it to light for me. You know, that's what I have to say. Thanks, um, Stacey. Uh, I'm just gonna open this question up to any any of you. Um, can Does anybody wanna talk about the effects of continued microaggressions and the macro impact on a person? Um, or even if you wanna give an example of an, uh, you know, a time maybe you've heard of an, uh, a specific comp a, a comment or an isolated event that stirred a reaction from you or maybe an individual you know from the past. Anybody want to share anything on that? Yeah, I, I would just like to add, um, oh. I love the analogy of paper cuts. <laughs> I'm a big analogy person, so that was, that was really good. Um, I think it really comes down to like human connections. And a lot of this is is tied to human connections, and that's why it's so um, disconcerting or hurtful when um, these situations come about because you, where well, human connection, you kind of attach yourself to the conversation, whether it's with your friends, your um, family, your coworkers, and then when a microaggression um, appears or, or happens, you're like, whoa, because when you open yourself up like that, it's very personable. So it, it's very hurtful you know, emotionally when that when those things happen. So, um, and I have a thousand examples of, of microaggressions over the years, but um, it's definitely a, a, a something that's challenging to handle and deal with when it does happen. Okay, thank you, Isaac. Uh, Daniel, you were gonna share something with us? Yeah, so thank you. And, and absolutely with the paper cuts. And I think another analogy I like to use often is how many of us have ever gotten a mosquito bite, right? Um, and some people seem to magically never get mosquito bites. And then some people, how, how many of you are like, I always get like 18 people could be there and it's only me, only me, right? And um, that's kind of the, to your question about that kind of continued effect of my progressions is there are many folks who wake up, they check their phone or they check the news or they, you know, th there's a microaggression, there's something that's happening, right? They go into drive in to get their coffee or, or they, eat, you know, they're another microaggression, right? There's this constant kind of feeling of I'm always being uh, bitten by mosquitoes, right? And again, some people are like, oh, just put some lotion on it or don't worry, it's no big deal, it's just a mosquito bite. But 
mosquitoes can also carry diseases, right? Um, they, they can actually harm you. And, and in fact, uh, we know in, in our history, mosquitoes have carried deadly diseases. And I think the continued impact of microaggressions really gets to this point of, it's just a joke. It's just a, it's no big deal. Why are you taking this so seriously? But as, as Sarah said, the thousandth paper cut or the, the millionth mosquito bite, all of a sudden the reaction is, is now so on the skin and, and rage and, and this other things that that could be the difference of interacting with, you know, certain parts of our community, the police and social workers and hospitals where that, that reaction, although to the person receiving it is like, that's not a, the person feeling it absolutely is, is, is impacted in such a dramatic and, and constant way. So I think that's how some of the, the experiences can, can keep going. Cause I think too, microaggressions are so built into our language and how we speak and things we say. And, um, you know, so there's so many things that we can say, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk and share later about what, maybe an example that I have, um, where it happened to me, but I, I, I think, uh, uh, that's where I, when, when I heard Sarah and Isaac kind of was like, Whoa, that this is that, that continued impact of just, I'm, I'm I don't want to get stung anymore. I agree. And I, I think that's why we're having this conversation today and making people more aware because, you know, we can't necessarily see the feelings inside someone. You know, we can mask those day to day, but we can't necessarily see what's inside. So I think the more we uh, educate people and allow them to be aware of it, that maybe you can start to pay attention to well, what am I saying? You know, and sometimes we can see it just in a shift in body language, so subtle, but to recognize, ooh, something changed here, something happened. So I, I'm loving the fact that we're having this conversation today. So thank you both uh, for adding to that. Um, right now, I'm going to shift over to Aaron. And Aaron, can you explain the impact of microaggressions from an organizational policy level? Sure. So, so we tend to think about microaggressions on that interpersonal level, um, but they're part of maintaining and creating systemic oppression as well. Um, you know, we have implicit and explicit biases that we sometimes act out in the form of microaggressions, um, and policy and culture can create or normalize these microaggressions and impact various facets of organizational life um, and life you know, societally um, as a result of, of how we live in relation to social policy. Um, so it's people that make policy, right? And so the thoughts and beliefs and feelings that fuel interpersonal behavior um, may manifest in the creation of oppressive policies. Um, and additionally, policy may allow for or reinforce or normalize behaviors, um, microaggressive behaviors, even by simply ignoring them. Um, and I think as Sarah said, you know, intent doesn't have to exist for culture and policy to do these things, to normalize or reinforce oppressive behaviors. Um, and so as a result of this, policy and culture can sustain or may sustain or grow environments in which individual and collective behavior is oppressive. Um, so this can show up um, in relation to organizational philosophy. So for example, um, colorblind philosophies or those that ignore difference in other ways through language, you know, just in, as, as an example that discusses, uh, let's say treating everyone the same. Um, so this kind of language, um, you know, just as it's important in our, you know, interpersonal interactions, it's important in relation to policy because these, and, and philosophy and culture, um, because these things frame uh, and lay a foundation for how we, we interact with, with each other in groups and organizations. Um, you know, language such as treating everyone the same uh, sustains a myth of meritocracy, it denies difference, um, and then it impacts as a result people um, intra and interpersonally. Um, this shows up in recruitment, um, you know, through uh, denial of isms and phobias. Um, for example, it's not, you know, it's not uncommon to say, let's say, um, we don't have black clinical social workers because there are not enough qualified black candidates. Um, you know, this is, uh, th this is a common way of ignoring an ism or a phobia um, in relation to recruitment. Um, shows up in performance appraisal systems, um, and that can impact 
who gets promoted and who doesn't. Um, it can uh, show up in, in relation to um, who holds influence in an organization. And, and you know, another, another thing, as Sarah said, that may be a little less tangible, um, but shows up in, in our systems. Um, so we could keep going with these examples, and I'm sure they'll, they'll pop up throughout the discussion. But the idea, again, is that, um, you know, people create and sustain um, these oppressive behaviors through systems. And so we have, we have opportunity through our organizational work and through our creation of policy um, to shift that so that we're creating healthier work environments um, and mitigating, at, at, to say the least, at the least, um, for you know, uh, negative impacts on, on, on individuals and on interpersonal interactions. Okay, wow, thank you, Erin. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge that we do have a question from the audience, and I'm going to ask that individual to hold on because we're actually going to get to that question uh, just a little later on. So please be patient with us, but thank you for that. Um, but right now, I just want to say thank you for everything that the panelists have shared at this point. Right now, we'd like to take a brief break from a and, and uh, have a message from Damon's Graduate Studies, and then we'll be right back. Damon College, we strive to help every student reach their educational and professional goals. With exceptional resources and one-of-a-kind learning experiences, our graduate and professional programs will put you on the right path to career success. Our graduate programs include applied behavior analysis, education, nursing, social work, and more. Seven of our 11 graduate programs are open to any undergraduate major. Explore our graduate programs today by visiting damon.edu slash graduate. Hello, and welcome back. And for those of you who may just be joining us, we are having a conversation on the impact of microaggressions and why they matter. And right now, we're just gonna continue our discussion with that. Um, so I'm going right back to a series of questions that I have for the panelists as we dig a little bit deeper into this topic. And so right now, I'm gonna go and uh, ask a question of Isaac and the question is, is it important to know that microaggressions can be verbal, behavioral, and or environmental? And can you talk about the differences and why they matter? Yes, um, it's definitely important to, um, um, to know that, that there is a difference between verbal, behavioral, and environmental um, and microaggressions. I think from a, I can go over like, specific examples. I know from a verbal example, I just remember some of my experiences. Um, I remember being younger and, and I'm not going to name the TV show, but there, there was an assumption that I watched a certain television show just because of the way I looked. And um, it, was, it was offensive I for me because I'm like, I actually did watch that show because I liked the show, <laughs> but I thought it was... Um, why did you assume that? And I immediately recoiled on, on, on the hearing that. So it was it was very it was very much hurtful to um, be assumed that I was in some kind of silo just because of the way I looked. Um, from a behavioral standpoint, a lot of times it just comes down to um, understanding in inclusion and understanding that if you're not involved in specific things that you know other people might be involved in or and then you're excluded from a an, a, an aspect of of a minority it's it's hurtful it's kind of like what did i do wrong like what's wrong with me and you really go inward on your your issues and then you start beating up yourself that it's your fault um most people would not know that, but that's something that you have to deal with uh, um, when you look different than the normal society, um, but or just society in general, what, what people consider normal, but which isn't normal. Everybody, no matter what you look like, is, is normal. Um, and then another thing is um, environmental. Environmental is a, is a big aspect in regards to going back to that whole 
um, human piece. And I think a lot of the issues are involved with just how people have perceived the world over time and just how maybe you, you were raised. And a lot of times people don't even know they're doing microaggressions. Um, and it's not just from an aspect of one group to another, like I've done microaggressions on other groups and didn't know I did that. That happens. And a lot of times it comes with age and experience. And for me, I have to peel back sometimes. And um, I think Daniel was saying uh, something about pausing. Um, I do that a lot. Sometimes I think to myself, wait, what are you saying? Does this make sense? You have to kind of understand that because I grew up in the 80s and the 90s and it was a lot different than now. So I do give people leeway in what they say or how they interact with me or other people. But on the same token, as we try to evolve as a society and people, we have to really have an understanding of what are we saying? What are we doing? And peel it back and take a pause and think about, is this, how does this affect everybody? Um, but that's hard for some people. Some people don't want to do that. Some people just want to just live their lives the way they want to live it and they'll deal with the consequences after. And I think that is the big challenge that we have with a topic like this um, as we move forward. I agree. It's something you were saying, you know, when you look at the environment and, and the fact is, is that, like you said, the way we were raised and the things that we were taught from, you know, your parents and your grandparents and those generations will carry. Uh, I was in, I was teaching a class just yesterday and we were looking at a video called the class divide. And, and one of the students picked up and said, it's interesting. The parent taught the child or told the child that wasn't a good neighborhood. And that's all you heard the child say. The child never investigated the neighborhood. The child never asked any questions. But the fact is, all they knew was that's not a bad, you know, that's a bad neighborhood. And then how do we take those things in and perceive them? And then I always say and turn them around and spit them back out at people. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's interesting. I like the fact that we do need to pause. We do need to think about what we're saying before we say that and what the impact could be. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think I. Daniel, this was a question I had for you. Uh, can you talk about any microaggressions you have experienced in your life and how did you respond to them? Yeah, I can, but if I could, I, um, Sarah, did you want to add something to the previous comment just so before I, I go into my examples? Sure, I, I know that you're going to be talking about the individual, Daniel, but uh, struck, something struck me about what Isaac said when you we were talking about the environment, and it was more of a personal example. So I know you're going to be doing that, but I'll offer this quickly. Um, I just one little statement. I never know when I walk into an environment, a new place, what people see when they see me. And that really gives me a lot of pause. And so if we think about the impact, um, that the environment might have, you know, based on past experiences, et cetera, and microaggressions that I may have felt, I never know what they're going to see when they first see me. When I walk into a store, a classroom, a bar, a bank, um, when I walk in front of a staff for the first time, an interview here, I don't know how I'm going to be received. And I think that comes from deep seated challenges um, and regarding identity, but also environments that I've been in. Um, will I be black enough, white enough, Latina enough? Um, is my, will they notice my hair being straight or curly? Like, is someone going to comment on that? Um, so I just, I was struck by what Isaac said and, and that question. And I just wanted to share that, that those things really impact identity and identity development and uh, the way a person, you know, moves through the world. Right. Thanks for that moment, Dan. Yeah, and it's interesting. You can't just walk in and be you imagine how much our mind just takes off and starts to have these preconceived notions already. So, wow, that was, that was powerful, Sarah. I'm sorry, Dan, I cut in ahead of you. Go right ahead now. <laughs> no, I wanted, I wanted to make sure I, I, the space was given to, to that comment. Cause I think that's really important to think about too, 
Um, and to Isaac's point about the pausing, we don't often unpack some of the things in our language that we are saying. So when you, Stacey mentioned about that, that's not a good school, that's a, that's a bad neighborhood. What does that really mean? I know that, and actually I'll, I'll give that as an example environmentally, uh, perhaps that I experienced. So when my, my partner and I were looking to buy a house, and, I'm, and I forgot to mention that, I live in uh, Akron, Ohio, uh, and, and of course work at Kent State University currently. And uh, we were looking to buy a home and through, near the area when I moved actually from out of state, I was from Georgia. And um, the realtor kept saying, well, are, do you have kids and all that? And we're like, you know, at the time no. And all this stuff and they're like well okay well but if you do that's not a good neighborhood and and or because of this that school is not that good and and now little did they know that i work in dei i i do this for a living and i'm absolutely comfortable challenging folks on what do you mean by when you say good bad that's it's whatever um and as we further interrogated then finally i said you mean that that's a black school mostly black school or do you mean that not everybody there is comes from a, a, a two parent uh, cisgender heterosexual relationship? Um, and they're they kind of like, oh, what, what do you what do you mean? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And, and that to that point, right? And so that's a that time I, I've had um, where people ha have shared uh, that. Um, and I want to share a quick story about another time where I felt where I had an opportunity and I didn't know this was my progression. I didn't know I was combating them. Um, it was actually a, 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 a graduate of University of Buffalo. So so uh, uh, horns up, right? Um, and I was an orientation leader and there were incoming students that kept saying things like, oh, um, this is so gay. Uh, oh, that's so gay, right? And, and, and they were referring to in the context things that they either didn't like or things that they were bad. And so what I did, and and, then, and I tried to flip the term, and this was a way for me to approach it, was every time they said it, I said, oh, do you mean that's so jock? And I was a student athlete and all that, so I, I understood what that meant by taking on that that stereotype, right? Um, and I, they're like, no, what do you mean? I mean, that's okay. And I'm like, and I we did this back and forth, and finally they said to me, why do you keep doing that? And I said, why do you? And it opened up the conversation to start to say again back to and i said this before about language intent versus impact and that, that has carried with me um my entire working and personal career as a, a, in life um because as i said with the realtor I, I was able to do it in a way that wasn't combative it wasn't you you are this you are bad you are racist you are all these and pick a pick the term right you're sexist you're misogynist all those other things like that um but I did it in a way that allowed for the conversation. Now, no, don't get me wrong. There are times when you need to call it out, right? And I have done that. Um, you know, my race, people look at me, they're like, are you tan? Are you, what are you? Um, I'm a Latino, I'm Puerto Rican. Um, and I remember a time too, uh, when I was in, in, a, in a program where it was for minor, minority students, um, I had other minority students come up to me and say, how are you in this program? You just look like you're tan. And so, so I, I say that to say that it's not just certain types of folks who are how they identify that they might do microaggressions. And Isaac was perfect about that. And later I can share another example of um, where I microaggress against people while doing a training on microaggressions. That was awesome and uh, definitely a humbling experience. But that those are a couple of examples that I have shared um, or, or, or have experienced that um, are personal and really in nature. Thank you. Those are those are really good examples. And, and the one thing I like is, you know, you didn't come back. You didn't attack. You just asked the question. It, it's kind of like you just questioned their questioning um, and forced them to think about well, you just asked me, why did I say that? I'm asking you, why did you say that? Um, to really think about, again, what they're saying. Like I said, sometimes we need to kind of like you mentioned, we need to pause and think about the things that we're saying. Uh, we do have a question for the audience from the audience that I'm going to ask uh, anyone on the panel. And it says, does microaggressions have any characteristics of bullying, whereas there might be a power imbalance between the targeted individual and the aggressor? Anyone have any thoughts on um, that? I can I can say yes. <laughs> um more when you're younger um definitely high school college yes um and 
that's a danger thing for me in regards to when that stuff does happen, um, because it's such a young age, it becomes in, binded into your brain and it really sticks for years on end and it's very dangerous. Um, and I'm always, when you think of like bullying and that, that word, I, I'm always like, we have to be very careful of like, how do you deal with that? And how do you tell certain individuals that might be doing that, that that's wrong and, and what can we do to make it better um, from a younger age um, situation? Just because when you're younger and that happens to you, it sticks with you. And then that person that that happens to, they remember it for years and years and years and years on end. And I remember things that happened when I was in high school that I still remember to this day. And it's like, it's like, how do I, why is this even in my head? But that's what happens because it's so shocking. Like I said before, when things like that happens, it gives you like a recoil and it's in it's it's very impactful and, and um something that I, I don't know how to address it from that age level, but it's something that is is a problem. That's interesting. It's you know, at that age level when and I think of younger children and experience and how that really affects their personal development throughout their life is so critical. And like you said, it's 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 it's, it's a tough area. That's all I can say. It's it's kind of a tough area. Uh, but thank you, Sarah. Were you going to add something to this? Uh, that was to a previous comment about um, humility and Dan Daniel talking about um, being a facilitator and being an educator and making those mistakes. Um, you know, the dominant narrative really gets you sometimes and you, it impacts all of us, but being humble and taking a step back and being brave enough to, to do that is, is really important as, as we move forward and develop and design strategies to, you know, intervene and create new spaces, um, as a result of microaggressive behavior. Okay. And it was one of the comments I just I saw from our audience that says, I try to combat microaggressions with my family and significant other. One thing I struggle with is when you educate them and they keep doing it. And she said at that point, that's where she gets stuck. So that's it's an interesting point there that we're talking about. It's like you're trying to make people aware and then you're like, you know, there's no change. And I think one of the things we have to consider there is that you know, these things have been occurring over and over for generations and generations that it may take some time to really move that needle. Like some people may need the reminder, not that we have to go after and attack them, but just the reminder that think about what you say, you know, take a pause minute or say, you know, that that right there was an example of a microaggression. So it's something that I say, no, it may not ha happen over time. And to that audience member, I would say, you know, it's something you may just have to keep working at. Uh, okay, I'm going to direct our next question to does somebody want to say something. If you don't mind me jumping in just about jump, jump right in, Erin. Um, so I just wanted to add a bit to um, remember all the details of the question, but just to note where that power imbalance and, and bullying may show up in organizations. Um, so I noted before, I, I mentioned before performance appraisal systems as a, as a common way microaggressive policies and practices, practices can show up in organizations. Um, you know, again, this doesn't have to be intentional for, for that power imbalance to play out and for bullying to occur. Um, but it's really common for organizations to have, you know, again, spoken or unspoken standards in these types of systems um, in which you know, the majority of people in an organization or a chunk of people in an organization are, are kind of um, looked over. Um, and so, you know, for example, um, languages or practices in evaluative systems that, um, you know, uh, prioritize or um, praise white American or cisgender male standards of um, leadership that look like assertiveness or competitiveness and visibility in organizations in a very particular way 
um, if those things are again spoken or unspoken, written written or unwritten in policy or practice, if those are the things that are prioritized and um, and uh, praised in some form um, through uh, promotions, um, bonuses, etc., um, then a whole bunch of people who have the opportunity to show leadership in a variety of other ways, let's say, are overlooked. Um, and, and this is a form of a microaggressive policy or practice and where that, um, that bullying can take place. Uh, similarly, when it comes to that, uh, those cultures of influence that I noted before, you know, who holds influence in an organization um, to sway uh, to sway change, um, to establish something, um, or to create something. Uh, again, similarly, if those, if the people who hold influence are primarily white, American, um, heterosexual, um, cisgender men or women, you know, those are uh, who there. There are a whole bunch of people left out of um, of influence and change in those circumstances. And again, that can be a form of bullying, um, intentional or not. Okay, thank you, Erin. Isaac, were you gonna jump in with something? Yeah, I just wanted to comment about the question about, um, I think um, she was talking about her family that she had brought up a bunch of different times and doesn't seem like anything's sticking. Um, I would say it all comes down to, um, it's kind of like continuing the, what what Aaron was saying was the basic cultural misunderstandings. Um, I think the only real way to get people to understand something else is to immerse themselves in it. And that can come in a bunch of different forms. Um, it can come in regards to what you're comfortable with, because what does that really does that mean? And I, I don't think it necessarily means I need to go to a specific restaurant. Maybe it's, but well, it could be that simple just to start out, or maybe it's um, a play or, or going to an art museum of, of, a, of, an, of an artist that isn't really in your social circle, or maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's just opening your, your, your social circle to different people or different voices or different audiences that maybe it's kind of you just kind of get in there and it, it's it's different for each person because certain people are not comfortable doing specific things but it, it can you start a bite size it can go right in and, and and there's different things you can actually do to like get yourself involved with different groups um, outside of the group that you're in because if you find yourself in a, in a bubble with a group of a lot of people that are similar to yourself, you're really closing yourself off in the world. And no matter how many books you read on microaggressions, eventually you're going to end up doing a microaggression just because you're not associated with what's going on in society. Isaac, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Aaron, I'm going back to you and I want to ask if you can talk about how microaggressions ultimately impact the environment and impact systems choices. Yeah, so I touched on the first part of that question a bit already, so I'll just speak to the latter part. Um, so, you know, I just want to throw out some examples of, of things to consider um, to help address, uh, to prevent or mitigate um, microaggressive policies and practices in, in organizations in particular. So, um, you know, I, I have a background in quality improvement. I think there may have been a question on that earlier, so I'll, I'll touch on that briefly. Um, so quality improvement um, is, a, is a common, uh, at this point, it's a common, um, there's most organizations or a lot of organizations have some sort of quality improvement system built into the work. And this is in contrast to, let's say, compliance or quality assurance. Um, so quality improvement is not a punitive approach, but rather um, an improvement-centric um, approach to looking at how to make changes in an organization. And so um, it's, a great, it's a great infrastructure and process for um, identifying an area for change and moving through a systematic process to 
to test out that change and see how it improves the organization. Um, so, you know, that can come up in relation to creating an inclusive and more equitable um, workspace by identifying projects to evaluate policies and procedures to assess uh, uh, the language um, in them and, and how that may impact how an organization functions. Um, so again, in relation to some of the examples from before, um, you can look at policies and practices around recruitment and performance appraisal. You can look at mission and vision and evaluate the language itself. Um, and you can also evaluate practices um, you know, uh, and procedures in relation to program development. Um, you know, for example, uh, it's not uncommon for um, organizations to have some sort of diversity and equity committee, but what is the impact that committee is making in relation to um, the authority it has or doesn't have as is written in the policy or practice that can make all the difference as to whether or not a change on a systems level can actually occur. Thank you. It, it, it also makes me think of when you were saying that in terms of like when some organizations have like diversity and equity and inclusion departments or in, um, committees, I always say, are you actually working to do it to have an impact or are you working to do it to check a box? And that's what we really have to look at because it's we don't need a box checked. We need action. We need movement forward to address some of these issues. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just say quickly too, you know, um, looking at the language and policies and procedures alone is never enough in that same vein. Um, it's about, it's one step in a series of steps that are necessary to create an environment where improvement is actually possible. Um, so yeah. I understand. Wow. Okay, we do have a question from the audience and I'll open it up to any of the panelists. It says, how much of an impact does culture play with microaggressions? Culture meaning coming from another country or your own family immigrated and you're the new generation. Anybody have any ideas? Anybody want to comment on that one? I, I, I can start if you all don't mind. Um, sure. I think culture is absolutely everything. Um, and also culture, anthropologically speaking, is not static. Right. And so it, which to your to the question, thinking about the generations of, um, of, of folks in your family and how they might have experienced their world and their environment or, or their society, uh, their schooling, etc., cetera, um, is, is dynamic. Right. Um, schooling in the 1960s compared to now, compared to the 1900s, compared to we go back to, you know, Civil War, etc. There are going to be different moments generationally of how people have experienced the world. The world has learned new things, shares new things in different ways. And so culture as we as, as I would think about it and, and all those things, language, traditions, um, uh, practices, um, I, I think can and does uh, impact uh, how microaggressions may manifest um, depending on maybe age, right? Um, so grandma and grandpa or great grandma and grandpa, they're still alive. Um, they speak about certain groups of people in, in with certain language, right? Um, and we know that um, there, there are things that have, have changed um, over time, both medically, so, uh, you know, and other other spheres um, that have influenced our culture and our way of being, right? Our way of, of, of experiencing the world. And so, for example, the, the term hermaphrodite is not a term that might be something that is used today. Um, it's it's actually looked at as different, right? Um, uh, where you have transgender, right? And and, and that could be a, a, an evolution of how things are. Um, just like uh, how you might uh, um, call certain individuals, the word Negro used to be how you identified a black person. If you called somebody a Negro today, in most circles that I know of, you're probably going to be looked at differently or people might feel microaggressed against or may just be deliberately like that feels like a, a, an aggression or uh, an assault, right? And so I think that culture absolutely does. And I, and I think there's and on all of that, there has to be some grace. Um, I, I talked a little bit earlier about how I have always tried to talk about these topics in a way that allows for the space for people to learn and understand, oh, that's different. I've never thought of it that way, or I never had to think of it that way. So when Aaron talked about white men, cisgender, how to, 
the systems are built, many of them are for them or have, but, and so they haven't had to think about what it means for pay equity. They just get paid. Right. And it, why would I think about that? And so there's, again, that's a culture. That's all culture. And I know that's a longer answer, but I think there's, when we think about how we maybe talk within our own families, right. Um, that could also be to the last question when it was like, my family member doesn't, you know, uh, listen, I think often, how might you then, if you care about them and you know you're not going to get rid of them or they're not going to be gone, how do you help make it personal to them so they can maybe see it from a different angle, right? Um, how do you center it in their children? How do you center it into the things they care about to start to think about ways that you can maybe say, you know, this is not how we should be proceeding anymore because culturally it's not appropriate. Wow, thank you, Dave. Um, we have another question, but then I also have another question uh, that I was geared towards Sarah, and I think we can kind of bring them together. So, Sarah, what I was going to ask you about is we know it's very important and we need to provide meaningful education to you can think of colleagues, friends and family so that they notice microaggressions when they happen. And so I'm looking at how can we educate them in this way? How can that be accomplished? And what ways can compassion help? But I'm also going to put out there, which was a, a question that came from the panel, because they said, what are the impact of microaggressions in the workplace? And what, if anything, should be done about microaggressions in the workplace? So I'm thinking we can kind of bridge those two together. And I know I'm directing it at Sarah, but also once she gives a comment, anybody else that wants to add to it would be great. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, and yeah, I, I can try to to reach that, but I welcome my fellow panelists to jump in. Um, I feel really confident with that. Um, DEIB, or Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, um, it's a priority, right? Um, and it's everyone's responsibility, and everyone should be about that fight, right? But how do we do it? It's hard. Um, I think it requires a concerted effort, a dedicated effort made by the entire community, um, whether that's the college community where I work or your whatever um, type of institution you're at in corporate America, wherever it is. Um, in the college community in particular, I think student voice must be central. Um, it's because who we're doing the work for, right? Uh, faculty and staff must be part of the plan and the work must be done consistently and ongoing. Um, scaffolded with compassion, and it should include, in pe include people who have experienced microaggressions historically and presently. Um, and we must add for, ask for feedback constantly along the way and be brave enough to hear those responses. Um, I think it starts with the mission and, and vision and values of the institution. Uh, employees need to know where their institution stands on DEIB and microaggression um, and bias in general. Um, mission and values must include that language. It must be demonstrated as a priority. There must be a priority as well on action and movements. Human resources, department leaders, supervisors, uh, et cetera, cabinet uh, must provide ongoing training and development and must be a part of the um, onboarding curriculum, if you will, at an institution. Um, and it has to be part of the everyday language. Uh, there should be a focus on particular areas, uh, dominant narrative, stereotype threat, power and privilege, bias, social identity, personal identity, right? Peers must be willing to intervene. I really think that that's important. I know it's hard though. Um, I think we need to lead with both our heads and our hearts. Compassion and empathy will pave the bridge to unity and to understanding because microaggressions at their core, right, they impact the heart of people. So having compassion for one another um, and ourselves promotes a willingness to learn. At Geneseo in particular, um, we have a few, a few different programs, if you will, big P programs that uh, focus on DEIB. Um, one, we just shifted our value of inclusion to belonging. That was something we did part of our vision. Um, 
the Advancing Cultural Competency, um, this is a certificate program that was designed by our CDO, Ravi Rautenberg, and our professor of psychology, Dr. Monica Schneider. A few of us are facilitators of that program. We have intergroup dialogue. Um, and Advancing Cultural Competency in particular was designed to empower people, our peers, um, our colleagues, um, with cross-cultural knowledge, understanding tools, et cetera. Um, the idea is to develop self-awareness, uh, transform personal um, and professional environments on our campus to be more inclusive or to help people feel like they belong. Uh, they're culturally supportive um, departments, uh, classrooms. Um, and the idea is that will impact cultural climate across the campus. We also have something called BIPR, Bias Prevention and Response. Uh, we focus on bias intervention, um, education, uh, when bias occurs. And then we also have the President's Commission on Diversity and Community. Um, and oh, on our annual diversity summit, what I think needs to happen in the workplace is there needs to be an opportunity for people to interact and that needs to be an encouraged. At the core, um, folks need to have an understanding. I like what Daniel talked about when he said, um, you have to have grace. Um, we have to have grace with one another if we're going to repair the hurt that microaggressions cause. We need to have patience. We need to take a pause. Um, I do think that things should be done about microaggressions in the workplace. Um, intervention strategies, restorative justice. But I think some of my colleagues want to add. So I could go on and on. Um, I will stop. Anybody want to add to it? Um, I, I, I'd just like to add, um, for me, the some of the biggest problems with, in, I'm working in an institution now, but even before that, I worked several years in in, in businesses and in, in small businesses in, in the area. And um, one of the big issues is that not listening, just assuming, just I read something or I talked to this one person, I got this, we're going to do this and this now, but not actually listening to the people that it impacts. You actually, I don't have all the answers, but either, nobody does, but if you're not listening and understanding what are people, what what is actually impactful to that group? And a lot of that just due to age, like, it's different from when I grew up. I can admit that. I don't know every single thing in regards to microaggressions or, or what impacts or what hurts what particular group. So I, I would just say, you just got to listen. And from there, like um, piggybacking what Sarah said, then we can build out what exactly we can frame around that that will impact that particular group because the fact is even it even goes down to an institution what would work at damon may not work at yale or may not work at stanford it's very very different so i think um it comes down to listening basically okay thank you very much anybody else want to add to that one no i just wanted to check because you know the both of you did a very good job of just you know explaining of of and and I, I know that Daniel kind of mentioned that awareness, knowledge, and skills, if you were to put it in just three simple words, you know what I mean? And then I think on the end of it, like you said, Sarah, we got to add grace um, because it's not going to happen just automatically or instantaneously. Uh, Daniel, I have another question for you, which is going to link to the question that was previously asked. And my question is, what role does validating the experience of others play in moving the microaggression dialogue forward. But I also wanted to link it to our earlier question from our audience member who said, how do you determine micro, microaggressions versus naivety? And when you feel that responsibility to enlighten and how do you balance intermittent aggressions with your pursuit of success? Wow, Stacy. Um, As a mouthful, right? That was that was, <laughs> that was a lot. Um, so, you know, uh, start uh, with the first one. Yeah, that's right. We'll 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 do this. I think um, 
Sarah introduced the, the concept of, of DEI and then the, the B letter that has been popping up more recently um, and belonging, right? And so people are like, well, wait, I thought DEI was enough, right? I, I think, you know, we think about diversity, we think about awareness, understanding the difference, right? We think of equity, we think of how do we uh, alter, change, dismantle systems that um, have disadvantaged certain folks. Aaron talked earlier about uh, uh, women faculty versus male faculty, right? Same level, same experience, all the things, right? There's there's certain ways where even though, um, uh, and then the the inclusion is, okay, fine, the, um, let me pull a chair up to the table, the proverbial table we all like to sit at, right? Um, but being at the table and not being listened to, to what Isaac mentioned, doesn't mean that you're belonging. That, that does, it, that's not belonging. Belonging is actually being heard and then actually things happening from that. Not, oh, thank you for your story. Okay, let's just keep moving, right? Um, because that's a microaggression. And validating somebody's experience as, eh, that's not really what we're talking about, is actually missing the point. We are talking about the experiences of, of all of us, right? And um, as we continue to become more diverse, we need to continue to be more equitable, not equal. Well, I'm just going to treat everybody the same. Well, that doesn't that doesn't help, right? That, that, that's not, that actually creates problems um, because how I'm treated versus Sarah or Aaron is needs to be different, especially in the workplace when it comes to merit, when it comes to salaries, when it comes to experience, right? Because uh, we have, you know, it's important to do that. And so I think when, for, so the validating piece, um, it, it's this, I, this, for me, again, the awareness of self, the knowledge of others, and then what are the skills in order to be able to do that and navigate that, right? We always talk about Oh, I can't, these difficult conversations. Let's talk about having difficult conversations. I like to change the language to let's have, a, let's actually talk about necessary conversations. They can, might be hard. They might be difficult, but they actually might be the most impactful. They might be the most productive, but they're necessary. Because if you change it instead of difficult, nobody wants to go into a conflict knowingly, most people, right? Oh, we're going to have a difficult conversation in our staff meeting later. Are you ready, Stacy? You're going to, oh, wait. Uh, you you ready to, you might come in defensive, you might come in, I don't want to go, I, oh, I got something else, right? All of a sudden, you're not validating. Instead of saying, we have a necessary conversation and this is the topic, let's keep it, let's let's go. Um, and then I think back to the, uh, hopefully that answers that piece. And then as far as the, the previous question that was asked uh, earlier by, I believe, Miguel, yes. um, is how do you determine if microaggressions are, are like, being a real or in, in, intentional or just somebody just doesn't know. Um, that's where the grace piece comes in. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the ways that you can respond to microaggressions, and, and these are ways you can be like, ooh, when something happens. Like if I say, Sarah, that was a really smart comment for a, a woman to make. <laughs> right? Now, you got some, I see the females and the uh, smiling because they probably heard that comment many times. Right? Um, and, you know, so somebody might be, Isaac might be like, ooh, and, and it diverts our attention enough to old uh, that space and grace to say, yeah, Daniel, that wasn't that wasn't what we're going to do. And then I have the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, and then stop there, and I'm sorry, and not give reasons why, right? Um, and so I think, you know, so for example, I'm going to tell you an example that I did on, on micro. So I train on microaggressions. I do DEI work all day, every day. It's part of who I am. It's, I, I try, and I'm always learning. I often used to say, and this is, could be environmentally or geographically, sometimes how you um, introduce or say ha hello to a group of people can be different. Sometimes it's you guys, y'all, right? Um, hey, guy, things like that. I used to say, hey, guy, I'm from Western New York, and um, I would do trainings like, hey, guys, it's we're time to do this training. And a faculty member said, can you please stop doing that? I'm, I'm not a guy. Like, please stop gendering me in that, in that space. I'm sorry. I'll be better. Next session, I'm doing another training about something else. Hey guys, did it again. She came to me again. She came to me again. And then, and finally, like it took me a while. Now, I'm not being naive. I know what I'm doing. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm not trying to microaggress, but I keep doing it because it's it's built into my core. It's built into my system of my way, my, my, my cultural programming, back to the other comment. And so then I'm like, wait, I used to live in Georgia and they say y'all. Y'all doesn't genderize anybody. And I think it's fun to say. So I pretty much now say y'all. Anytime I introduce into a group, it doesn't matter if they're, I think they're all women or I think they're all men or whatever. I just say, y'all, it's time to do this. Right. And so I think that that's how you can understand 
Um, if it's you now, there'll be a point where people will be told, will be told, will be told, and then they keep doing it. To me, I think then you're just not wanting to change or you are actually intentionally trying to cause harm. Um, and, and, and that could be if you're a coordinator or a student or the president of the university or a company, it, it, right? It's, so I think that's where it, it, it can be there. So hopefully I answered that. I know I kind of jumped around, but I, uh, again, it's, it's thinking about um, taking the listening piece that Isaac mentioned and then actually including the things that they uh, say in the changes that are happening to allow them to feel like they actually belong. They, then you're doing the, the whole gamut of actually DEI and B. And if you feel like you belong, you're more likely to want to stay. You're more likely you want to contribute. You're more likely to defend and uplift people. And you also know that, hey, you know what? We do need to evolve as as society changes, right? The, la the pandemic has changed how we do things technology wise, right? We do know that we can have meetings now uh, via Teams or Sky Skype or Skype. That makes me feel older. Uh, <laughs> Zoom, et cetera, right? Um, where we before had to walk across campus in the cold, right? For those of y'all in Damon, like it's cold. You know, and it, it, even in the small you're going to get blown over, right? And <laughs> there's certain spots between DS and, and, and all that. So anyway, I'm going to be quiet now to hopefully um, I've added, uh, answer what part of what Miguel was talking about. Um, because if I think if you do that and you validate and people feel like belong, the success, the pursuit of success is more real, realized or more able because of that. Whereas if you don't, it, it, it stalls and or rolls us back to times we don't want to be part of or shouldn't be. Okay. Thank you, Dane. I just, you know, I looked at Miguel's question again, and it says, how do you determine microaggression versus someone being naive? And in my mind, I said, does it really matter? You know what I mean? Does it, does it really matter if it was a microaggression or if somebody was just naive and, and doesn't know at that point, should we just recognize that maybe that person needs to be informed? Maybe that person needs to be educated. Maybe that person just needs to be aware. I, I was just thinking about it and said, I don't really think we have to decipher, was it this or this? It's a matter of, it's something that needs to be addressed. Can I jump in real quick? Go right ahead. I I like what you said, Stacey, and, and I agree. It, it needs to be addressed. I think you can break it down in the in using the phrase intent versus impact um the intent you know i the intent could have been from a <clears throat> a place of naivete um or it could have been intent you know it could have been something you know direct and and and, and meant to be um but regardless of what that was it's the impact it's how the other person's receiving it that's what matters and and so i just wanted to expand upon that um i think it's really important as we navigate this territory and we work with students and colleagues and, and, and others that we think about how our actions are impacting them. You know, what influences are we, are we having in other people's lives? Cause that really, really matters. Um, the intent in the end, uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, we have to have grace. We need to be thoughtful. And if we're, you know, counseling and attending, supervising, um, or if you really want to build an external relationship, yes, that intention, those are things we can discuss and continue to uh, work through. But in the moment, it's that impact. That's what matters. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm actually going to switch. I had another question, but I think we've really talked about how we can engage in conversations to shift culture, work, school, and every day. I think we've really kind of talked about that already. But I wanted to go back to another question I had. And, um, and open it up to, to any of you. And I just say, as an experience, as an organizational leader, um, can you talk about what questions you are most frequently asked or have encountered as it relates to microaggressions? Have any of you have people who've come to you and just, whether it was seeking information, um, whether it was trying to understand maybe what happened in a situation, I was just wondering if either one of you could share something on, on that in that area.
Um, I can I can say that I was sitting here trying to think of if that actually happened, but I guess that's a good question in regards to no, I, not off the top of my head, but how do you feel comfortable approaching that? Um, I think a lot of times when things happen, how do you feel comfortable addressing that with that certain individual is hard and I don't think it actually happens. And I think the word I comes to my brain is like, I become muted to certain things. So I don't even see it all the time because I'm so used to it. But how do you address something even if you feel that way and let alone get to a point where you feel comfortable talking to someone else about it? So I think that's a challenge. Um, I think that's the next evolution of, of how you deal with this. But um, I don't have any specific example, at least on the top of my head, at this moment. Okay. I, I mean, when I thought about the question, I'm thinking, you know, with, uh, it, it even sounded like something that could potentially go to the HR department, depending on what was said or, or, or the situation um, that may have come about. Um, because I don't know if anybody will come right out and say, at this point, can you tell me, is this a microaggression or how do I recognize one? Um, I don't know if we're there yet, but it was interesting. I, I was just looking at something that was in the chat and uh, an individual said, I work where guys call women honey as they couldn't remember their names. And it just, of all, and I'm just, this was just an example. And I thought that was such a very simplistic of example of something that can have a huge impact. And Stacey, can I add to that? And I, cause it's something that sure. comes to the organizational piece of uh, being asked about microaggressions. And one of the things that we have worked on and continue to work on and, and need to tr continue to try to get right, and cause we haven't been perfect at it yet, um, uh, is uh, the idea of chosen names. And, and so I think to Jackie's point about being called, now there are again, some cultural geographic ways in which people refer to people in, in, as a form and in their mind, a form of endearment, right? And, and not necessarily trying to be negative or, or anything like that. But one of the things we're doing at, at, a, at the university level is chosen name. It, but some people may hear it as preferred name, right? We hear preferred, what are your preferred pronouns? And like, I, I like to take the word preferred out because I prefer my coffee black. Some people prefer it with lots of sugar, right? That's a preference. Um, but my like, and then my name, for example, is something that's my chosen name. Um, my chosen name is matched and does match my legal name. My legal name is Daniel. And, and some people that's not the case, right? Um, and so, and, and I will also say the evolution, right? So I have some friends on this, um, not only at Damon, uh, but even on this panel that have knew me when I did not go by Daniel, right? I went by Dan or Danny. That was that was my nick, you know, names I was referred to, and I go by Daniel now. And even today, you might have heard some say Daniel and some say Dan. And um, to me, again, I there's moments where again there's grace, and there's moments where I'm like, um, I don't have to have everything be a teachable moment. But I do have faculty and staff come to me and ask me about is this a microaggression? How should I approach this lesson? Um, things like that. And I think that's the nature of my job um, and, and my role uh, and how people have seen me because of the things I do, uh, both on campus and, of course, externally. Um, but, I, but I think, again, when we think about um, some of the easiest ways in which we can actually uh, affirm people, it starts with their name. It's right. It, that's the first thing that we could absolutely affirm them. If, uh, if Aaron and her classes refuses to or, or to, appears to refuse to not try to get somebody's name correct or the name they want to be called like then that student is probably going to say i don't like aaron i'm not going to try i want to be switched i want to leave damon college right Th there's some impact right with and, and consequences that can absolutely impact the system even though it's at the individual level um but again i think from an organizational i've had that where we're looking at Imagine all the communications we send out to students, to send out to families that have somebody's name on it. And imagine if every single time you don't have the right name, or if, and, and for those who are transgender, you dead name them. 
that name and meaning the, the name in which they might have legally been named is no longer their name and it's not who they are it's not how they identify and that's absolutely a microaggression i think it goes beyond that but that that's an example of from an institutional or an organizational standpoint how might you look at creating um, and challenging systems we're like well that's how our mail merge is well can you add a column that has chosen name and pull from there instead of the other one um right and there's things that those conversations that we're still having and trying to think at an organizational level well what about state licensure what about you know things like that right there's things that absolutely have to uh, be considered but if we're not even at least doing a, a chosen name i think then then we're we're we're, we're not really creating an environment where people want to be there. That's a great point. That really is. Um, I did see another question um, from the audience, and um, they said they keep coming back to children. Adults speak and train children. How much of an impact does social media play in perpetuating incorrect communication? Anybody, any thoughts on that one? I think social media right now is how uh, a lot of our young people are being educated. Um, there's a lot of information, you know, out there that's false and hurtful. And there's some that's, you know, helpful. Like, there's a lot that I learn about what our students are doing um, via social media. I think it can perpetuate harm. So if we're speaking now about children, in particular young children, I think it's an opportunity to figure out what they're watching, what they're listening to, and having open dialogue. And, and may I add, as, as somebody who was trained in early childhood and also has a three and a half year old, um, my daughter um, hears things and repeats it. Um, more so than we would like, right? How many of you have been around young people and they they seem to pick up everything and even the things you're like ooh. and then when they get it contextually right and it's not a good thing you're like, Ugh, right if there's that feeling uh that is that is challenging and does social media play a role in that yeah to sarah's point especially um you know once uh you know, young people and, and it's, it feels like it's younger and younger than it used to be but you know so young people we used to be like maybe high school but now it's in even middle school where kids have access to social media or it's it's more prevalent um, or parents and family members have it open and around them. I mean, I'm on my Instagram a lot and the sounds and the songs and the things that come out of my phone, my, my daughter hears. And is it all appropriate, age appropriate? Probably not. Um, so I think there's a, the idea of sometimes we have to continue to be un, unlearn some of the things. I, like the, the old adage that I've you always heard, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, um, I don't know if that's entirely true. I think you can continue to try to, you know, reprogram just like all of us get, you know, educated differently. I didn't meet same sex couples until I was in college. Like I wasn't because where I grew up, who lived around me, it wasn't talked about. If it was, it wasn't positive. Right. And and to me, no, now though, that's not something that is, I mean, I, 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 I'm, it's all the time. So I think we can always be relearn but I, I think there's uh social media yeah, i know that we always like to blame social media or like to put that out there as a thing it goes back to the human interaction it comes back to what do we do once the social media is not there mm -hmm. right um and continue to do that and so um that's my my thoughts on that and I, I feel like we're getting close to uh a, a maybe another question or or, or maybe <laughs> something else should, should speak i don't know that any, we do Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say it's social media for me is like the gift and the curse. Um, maybe we are in like some kind of, I don't know if it, it's actually been coined as a digital enlightenment era or some kind of enlightenment era where it's awesome that a five-year-old can learn an unbelievable amount of stuff that I didn't have like, I had to go to the library. It's like, right, get a computer. You can read so much stuff, but um, there is no guardrails, so it's going one way as a gift and the other way as a curse. And if you pull back on the curse, do you pull back on the gift? I, I don't know. So I think it's it's a challenge. I, I don't exactly know where it ends. Um, 
and I guess that's the scary part. I think we're all still on this social media ride, so to speak, and where where we're gonna go with it, I don't know. And that's fun, but it's also very scary because it it does cause some <laughs> problems in 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 regards to biases and stuff like that. So I don't know. <laughs> It's a whole other panel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we did have one more question that I was going to pose to everyone. And it was, what does microaggression look like for the bystanders? What does microaggression look like for the bystanders? I think I, I just want to jump in really quick. Uh, I, Daniel, when, <laughs> when he made the faux comment uh about uh women and that was a smart comment i think for a woman a smart response i, I think he described it uh, you know it's perfectly what happened and i think the people who identify as women on the panel you might have all seen us smile or like go oh right oh i i think that's an opportunity uh well one you just saw what uh, what that looks like for the bystander right um that's physical. Like you, you can see it. So what does it look like for them? Uh, you, you often will see the shoulders, the face, the, you'll hear like, what did that just happen? Um, it's an opportunity uh, as a bystander to be pro-social, right. To intervene. Uh, and there's another question I saw in the, in, in the, in the chat box about um, not ex expectations of others. Um, I, I, as a value of mine, I, I try not to have excitations on others because I can get disappointed, right? Um, some people really will intervene, um, and that is, that is part of their makeup. It's an opportunity to be pro-social in that moment, and if you see something, say something. Um, it can look like, hey, and I think Daniel also made an example of this earlier, Hey, um, maybe maybe that wasn't the right thing to say, or what did you mean by that? It's an opportunity, certainly, to uh, make an impact in a positive way to turn the conversation around. Um, but it it can create, um, you know, discomfort for certain. It could stop a, an event. Um, it can uh, turn the event into something else. Well, yeah, and if I could real quick uh, add is the, the idea of, of if you're just being a bystander, then you're just observing and watching and you're doing nothing. And the idea of being an active bystander and, and you can do things in order uh, to uh, earlier talk about bullying. And I, and I think I'd like to add the word about privilege. Right. Because um, sometimes you might not even notice or hear it or maybe you did, but it, you didn't know it impacted the person because it didn't impact you. Right. Um, the comment I made that Sarah just highlighted, if, if that was said out loud, now, today, I'm responding and saying something like, bro, now we ain't, that's not how we talk. Um, and, or I might be like, you mean they're just intelligent people? Like that was an intelligent comment. That was an amazing contribution. Or when I go and say the same thing that Aaron just said, uh, they're like, oh, great. Awesome. Good job. That's a great idea, Daniel. Let's do that. And I'll be like, well, actually, it's Aaron's idea. So how about you make sure that Aaron gets that? Like, that's a way for me to be an active bystander or, or an advocate. So I think ally to advocate is that is that piece that allyship is like, to me, I believe women should be paid as much as men. I believe anybody should marry who they want to marry. And, and I can go on and go on and go on. Uh, but the advocate is that how do I leverage my privilege or privilege is that I didn't earn in a way that allows for these microaggressions to be limited or eliminated from the new culture that you're trying to uh, build, right? We talked earlier about DEI plans and statements and checking the boxes. No, this is the new culture. This is how we're going to engage from here on out. Uh, yes, we might have always done that, but that doesn't mean we always have to. And so I think that's where some, some activism, and it's not activism in the sense where people have attached it politically lately, to this idea of I'm, I'm against you. Activism does not mean that you have to be against or be violent or or anything like that, right? And, and I think Erin could probably speak more to this with her background. So I think that's how I look at this idea of if you're a bystander, then what are you doing with, with that? Especially now that you've listened to today, right? 
especially now. Um, so I don't know, Aaron, Aaron. Yeah, I'll just, just just really briefly to add to that. I you know I think um, along with that I think of it about creating a culture of accountability. Um, you know, and not in relation again to like a punitive stance, but just simply you know how can we collective how can we create a space where we're collectively working together and gathering feedback and taking steps to improve, and that's about accountability, I think. Thank you, Aaron and uh, Daniel, very much. Uh, this last question I have, I was going to direct it to Isaac. Um, and then if anybody else wants to add to it, please feel free. Um, what do you wish others would contribute to this conversation regarding microaggressions? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I've heard so much. So I guess, I, I mean, I would, I think it's already been covered too as well. It's just like, does anybody have any like examples of, of experiences and just how reliving that experience, how you would have um, uh, changed or, or, or done things differently or, or how you would have handled it differently now that you have more, you know, experience or, or, or background of, of, of what that was. And, and did I, did I do it exactly right? Usually when you relive something, you can always do things completely different. Um, I guess I guess I could start with like one example um, real briefly. Um, I think, um, I guess if, if I went back to the original one from earlier when I was talking about um, the TV show <laughs> that, um, or I, what, I, what would I have said or said differently I think I probably would have, like I said, I didn't watch it, but I maybe I should have said I did watch. I do watch it, but why is why is that an issue? Like, why is that funny? I don't understand. Can we have a conversation about that? Um, I also another example is sometimes for me personally, I catch myself saying, I might say girl instead of woman or young lady, but that goes back to when I was younger and then trying to reassociate the way you talk to being a professional now. So I'm always pausing just to make sure, why is this still in my brain? Because you've been saying it for 25, 30 years before this and you can't get it out of your head yet, but then I've gotten really, really good at that. Say, woman, young lady, being very good with my pronouns. I'm very proud of myself, but I guess that's a challenge. <laughs> Continual. <laughs> Did anybody else want to add something? It might be just that last bit of information, a last thought, or something you wanted to share that maybe we didn't touch on. Because I agree, we touched on quite a bit. <laughs> we did. It, it, it was definitely, uh, um, uh, it was a lot. I was going to say something else, but it was definitely a lot. And I think there's a lot of information that was shared. Um, you know, there was an awareness here. There was, this, this was just a very rich conversation. And I'm hoping that people are going to walk away uh, with, uh, you know, the beginning of trying to shift that mindset or maybe to get that, that little bit of let more education or more awareness, or even if it's just they walk away with, let me pause before I speak. Stacey, if I could, I think what way I would probably affirm that is the idea of individual agency. What can I do in my own sphere with my own people I feel comfortable with, whether that's family, colleagues, friends, co-workers, et cetera, and then collectively begin to build awareness and knowledge. And then that way the skills together doesn't seem like it's all one person's job. It's not the DEI person's job to do all this work, right? It, it's not the chief diversity officer to do all this work. Um, it, it's not the director of this or what, it is all of our jobs to make sure that we can continue mm -hmm. to build the environment, the culture, the society. So individual collective where the change can happen to allow us to actually make a difference and know that we will never always get it right. And that is okay as long as we're always trying to get it right. I think when we stop, that's when we have issues. That's where we go further apart. 
Um, and that's where it makes it difficult to be your true authentic self. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much for that, Daniel. Um, if no one has anything else, I just want to thank each and every one of you, Sarah, Daniel, Aaron, Isaac, um, for all your contributions, just for sharing. And, and I even say, you know, um, we're in a society that in order to share some of this, we also have to be vulnerable too, right? We have to be willing to, to open up and, and be honest with ourselves as well as others. So I thank you so much for that. Um, I thank give thanks to everyone um, who made this panel possible, our sponsor, the graduate programs at Damon. Um, for more information at Damon, you can go to www.damon.edu. Um, and I just want to let everybody know, keep your eyes open for more uh, interactive virtual events coming soon. And you can see those or get the updates on those by looking at our social media channels. We got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. We got them all. <laughs> so thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much to our sponsors. And thank you so much to our audience uh, for a wonderful time here. Thank you, everyone. Stay well. Be well, everyone. Damon College, we strive to help every student reach their educational and professional goals. With exceptional resources and one-of-a-kind learning experiences, our graduate and professional programs will put you on the right path to career success. Our graduate programs include applied behavior analysis, education, nursing, social work, and more. Seven of our 11 graduate programs are open to any undergraduate